Well, after that short interlude, evidently I froze. And so we've got to start again. You may remember what I said, you may not. Anyway, over the past year, I've invited you in these home retreats to share with me the particular insights and emphases of the different Gospel writers, Mark in September, Matthew in November, and Luke in June. We come now to John, which is very different from all these. To begin with, I don't think this difference is merely chronological. I don't think John is necessarily later than Matthew and Luke. He's merely different. He uses some of the same traditions about Jesus, but shapes them differently. You could say he's more developed or more reflective theologically, but that doesn't mean to say he's later. Your essay on earthworms or electronics or whatever may be more reflective, more or less detailed, more thoughtful than my essay on earthworms or electronics. But this doesn't mean that you're older or younger than me. It just means that you think in different ways. And John presents the mystery of Jesus differently. For instance, John has fewer miracles, cures and healings, and no exorcisms at all. And each of them, or almost each of them, is developed into a reflective speech, pointing out the lesson of the action. The Johannine Jesus speaks at greater length, no, no longer the short, pithy epigrams like the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, or to change the Sabbath's observance, or that dreadful saying, leave the dead to bury their dead. On the whole, the Johannine Jesus is much more careful to make his claims and confront his opponents with his own position and relationship to God. In this sense, the claims and self-description of the Johannine Jesus are more explicit. A second major external difference is that the other three Gospels all share roughly the same shape. Ministry in Galilee, followed by a four or five day visit to Jerusalem for the final climax. So the first three Gospels are called synoptic Gospels because they share the same basic time scheme and same pattern, though each of them has some incidents which don't appear in the other two. In John, however, Jesus goes backwards and forwards from Galilee to Jerusalem, visiting Jerusalem four times. In John, the cleansing of the temple is at the beginning, in the synoptics it's at the end. So in John, Jesus begins his ministry by taking possession of the temple. In the synoptic gospel, he climaxes his ministry at the very end by taking possession of the temple and using it as his own. In the other gospels, there's no prolonged or elaborate scene like the conversations with Nicodemus, or the Samaritan woman. There's no bread of life discourse in the other Gospels, no discourse after the Last Supper, the short one in Luke. There's no dramatic confrontations like the cure of the man born blind. Just a word on who the evangelists are. To my mind, Mark is a wonderful storyteller and I picture him as a catechist who taught about Jesus by telling the stories he'd collected. Matthew is the most Jewish of the Gospel writers, harping on the fulfilment of the law by Jesus and his changes to the law. Luke is a sophisticated Hellenistic traveller from a distinctively richer background. About the author of the fourth Gospel, we know more and we know less. There is no scriptural evidence or hint that the author was John, son of Zebedee, still less John Mark, who comes as a companion of Paul. I'm convinced that all we know about John is that the source of the material comes from the beloved disciple. This we're told in the final chapter of the Gospel, at the breakfast party with the risen Christ by the Lake of Galilee. We don't know who this beloved disciple is, 
and I think he's a symbolic figure, built on one of the apostles, one of the twelve. We're carefully and deliberately not given his name because he's the faceless model of the disciple. He appears four times in the Gospel, the beloved disciple, firstly at the Last Supper, next to Jesus, intimately sharing with Jesus his Eucharist. Secondly, at the cross, forming the first Christian society by his union to Mary. Jesus' last act is to hand over his spirit to them, thus forming the first community. Thirdly, he appears at the empty tomb. He arrives first, doesn't go in, but let Peter go in first. Peter doesn't understand, and John, the disciple of love, understands about the resurrection. Fourthly, at the Lake of Galilee, he's marked out as the trident of the tradition, as handing on the tradition about Jesus. So these four marks are the marks of any disciple of Jesus, any disciple whom the Lord loves. We don't know the name of any particular beloved disciple of Jesus, nor that he wrote the Gospel, and indeed he didn't write the final chapter, but he's mentioned in it. But he's the source of the material. That is typical of the Gospel as a whole. The reader is never quite sure of the ground on which he or she stands. I think this is deliberate on the part of the author, who is revealing a mystery which cannot be fully understood. In the dialogue with Nicodemus, he's rightly puzzled, Nicodemus is rightly puzzled, how anyone can be born again. Jesus is leading him to a hidden reality. In the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman, what is the living water? Is it merely fresh water from a spring, or is it the water of life which can be given only by Jesus? Jesus seems to be teasing her. They're teasing each other, and she, Jesus, teases Jesus. Oh, I see you're a prophet, sir, she says. Bring your husband, says Jesus. Oh, I don't have one, she replies, leading him one step further each time. And it's through misunderstanding that we progress further toward what can never be fully understood. So the whole story of John is a gradual penetration into the mystery of Jesus. It begins with the mystery of the prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is presented as the wisdom of God, who or, or which, in the Old Testament Book of Wisdom, stood beside God at the creation, the plan or template of the world, the thought of God, which he brought into being by creating. In the Book of Wisdom, Wisdom says, when he traced the foundations of the earth, I was beside the master craftsman, delighting him day after day, ever at play in his presence, at play everywhere on his earth, delighting in the children of men. So the prologue of John starts in the heavens, in the presence of God, then it comes down to the earth, as the word was made flesh, and finally returns to heaven, we saw his glory, the glory as of an only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. The revelation of the glory runs through the Gospel, and I want to look especially at three instances, the marriage feast at Cana, the confrontation in the temple, and finally the passion narrative. The marriage feast at Cana is typical of the paradox of John. His hour has not yet come, yet the disciples see his glory. Everything is highly symbolic and full of promise for what is to come in the rest of the Gospel. The six water door jars of the Jewish purification are one short of the perfect number, seven. So they're the symbols of imperfection. The water of the Jews is the wonderful gift of the law, which gives life, which sustained life throughout the Old Testament. 
and is turned into the plentiful wine of the final marriage feast of God and his people. And in what quantity? 180 gallons of wine. This really is messianic plenty, the symbol of the coming of the Messiah for the final wedding feast. Mary, the mother of Jesus, initiates the action, but with exquisite tact, tact and full trust. She'll be there at the end, too, when she and the beloved disciple received the Spirit at the foot of the cross and formed the first Christian community entrusted to each other. Then Jesus protests at the marriage feast of Cana that his hour has not yet come, though in another way it has, for they believe and see his glory. The hour is a mysterious presence throughout the story, for at his visits to the temple and his confrontations with the Pharisees, we hear again and again that they can do nothing to him because his hour has not yet come. And then the hour finally comes at the Last Supper. Jesus, knowing that his hour has come. It's only at the end of the story that we see that it is all suffused with his glory. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Already seeing the glory of the only begotten Son in the embrace of the Father. The word for glory is used in secular Greek to denote good reputation or honour, but in the Bible it's far stronger. It denotes the awesome and frightening majesty of God, the majesty that prevents his holy name being pronounced, the majesty which leads to Uzzah being struck dead when he puts out his hand to support the ark on his way up to Jerusalem. You don't support and patronise the ark of the presence of God, the cloud of whose glory fills the temple, before whom the seraphim cry out, Holy, Holy, Holy. The second scene on which I wish to reflect is the first major confrontation with the Jews in the temple. When Jesus has healed the man at the pool of Bethsatha and is accused of breaking the Sabbath, he replies, with what seems to be the clearest explanation in the Gospels of the relationship of the Father and the Son. It's forbidden to work on the Sabbath, yes, but God himself has to work on the Sabbath, for babies are born on the Sabbath and God gives them life. People die on the Sabbath and God judges them, so he has to work on the Sabbath. In a double series of sayings, in chapter 5 of John, Jesus gives a dynamic explanation of his exercise, his own exercise of the divine power. The Son exercises the same power and receives the same honour as the Father. In three ways, he gives life no less than the Father does. The hour is coming when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear it will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he is granted to the Son to have life in himself. Secondly, the Father has granted to the Son authority to give judgment because he is the Son of Man. So the Son of Man judges with the judgment of the Father. The Father has given all judgment to the Son so that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. So the three things by which the Son and the Father are united. We're accustomed to a definition of the Trinity in terms of essence or being, a way of thought typical of Greek philosophy. That's what comes in the creed, coming from the early era, early centuries of our era. Hebrew, on the other hand, gives a dynamic definition in terms of action, and that's what we have in the Gospel of John. Father and Son have the same power to, to give life and to judge, and they receive the same honour. Each of them acts not merely with equal power, not merely each with identical power,
but with the very same power exercised by both father and son. This will later be expressed that the two persons have the same divine nature. The third moment on which I wish to concentrate in John is the revelation of glory in the hour of Jesus, for which we've been waiting right through the Gospel from the marriage feast at Cana. It finally comes, this moment of glory, the hour of Jesus, in the Passion narrative. In John, this is the hour not of degradation and suffering, but of the hour of Jesus' triumph. So there's no agony in the garden at all. Before the supper, Jesus has already said, he cannot say, take this cup away from me, for it was for this hour that he came into the world. When the arresting party comes, Jesus challenges them, whom do you seek? And they reply, Jesus of Nazareth. And he replies with the divine name, I am, or I am he, ego eimi in Greek. It was for this declaration in the temple before Abraham was I am that they'd taken up stones to throw at him in the temple. And in the garden, in reaction, the soldiers fall to the ground, step back and fall to the ground in involuntary homage. They can't arrest him until he's given permission. There's no scene of trial or mock trial before the high priest and council but only the confrontation with Annas, in which again Jesus is running the show and he makes Annas look silly. But the real triumph begins with Pilate, in the scene with Pilate. Pilate, the judge, looks silly when he brazenly asks, what is truth? Then Jesus is himself seated on the judgment seat, still wearing the purple robe and crowned. And before him, the Jews deny what is most sacred to them. We have no king but Caesar, they say. Then Jesus is himself, well, if God is not king, then Judaism falls to the ground. What are the Psalms? The Lord is king with majesty enthroned. So while the Jewish leaders deny the most sacred of their religious beliefs, Pilate, instead of condemning Jesus, proceeds to insist that the titulars on the cross should proclaim him king of the Jews. There's no need for Simon of Cyrene, for Jesus carries his own cross as a sort of triumphant standard, a triumphant banner. And Jesus remains in control of the situation. It's his hour of triumph, and in that last action, he unites mother and son, to give over his spirit. With typical Johannine ambiguity, it's quite unclear whether spirit should or should not have a capital letter. But the Greek certainly suggests that Jesus is passing over his spirit to Mary and to the beloved disciple. Is this the Holy Spirit? It's only then that Jesus, knowing everything had now been completed, consents to die. Is this the fulfilment of scripture? Tetelestai in Greek. It is complete. Is it the ending of his life or the completion of his work? And such is the hour of Jesus. Now, if you wish to make this a full day of retreat, I suggest that at different times of day, you read and pray through those three incidents, the marriage feast at Cana, at the beginning of the second chapter of John, the confrontation in the temple in John chapter 5, and the passion narrative in John chapters 18 to 19. And God bless you.